in this series, uh, it's called Known, God's Plan for Happy, Holy, and Healthy Relationships. And the truth of the matter is, is that all of us want to be known. Uh, everybody. It, it doesn't matter. Like if it's a, a little child, they want to be known, right? Uh, and, and they just keep wanting to be known as they continue to grow up. I, one of my girls' favorite things, I've got four girls, 11, and then I have one who turns 10 this week. And then seven and five. And uh, all of them love alone time, right, with, with one of their parents. And so it doesn't matter where we're going. We can be going to take trash to the dump. And it's like, can I go? Like, I'll have your ear and nobody else will be talking, right? Like, this is uh, uh, what it means to live in a large family. And so they, they want to be known. They want to know, be known about what's going on with their school and what boy they have a crush on. And, like, all these things, right? They want to be known. You know, that doesn't really change as you grow up, does it? Uh, we all want to be known. We want to be known, uh, and, and that's why people date, and that's why they get married. They, they want to have this relationship with a person where they're really known and still loved, right? Where, where they're totally known and totally accepted unconditionally. And so they search their whole lives to find this one person who's going to be the one who totally knows them and totally loves them, right? And, and, and so then they, they launch out into marriage, and, and, and then there's still this desire to be known, right? And then it, it continues through friendships and other things. And so we're, we're going to look at this series, the Song of Solomon. We're going to go through the book of the Song of Solomon together. And uh, we're, we're going to see God's plan for being known. And we're going to see God's plan for being known in, in relationships with the people around us. And this is so important because um, it affects every area. It affects every area. And so th this series is not about just sort of dating or marriage stuff. This is about parenting. This is about being a grandparent. This is about being a friend. And, and so we're going to take the lessons from the Song of Solomon. And, and then we're going to be able to see how God knows us and how we're supposed to mirror that and reflect that to the people that are around us. And so, but, but there's a problem for all of us, right? Uh, that it's not easy to be known. It's not easy to really be known, and then it's not easy for the people we really know to accept and love them unconditionally, right? Because we all bring some of this into every relationship, don't we? Like, think about this, like the, the, the baggage that you bring into your dating life, right? Like you're, you're not just relating to the other person. Nobody starts with a blank slate. Like you're bringing in all the stuff from your family, Right? This is what normal looks like, whatever I haul around in my bag. Right, This is the wounds that I had from my family. This is the stuff that we didn't get right, right. And then you haul that into this relationship. And so many people are like, I want you to fix this. And how does that work out? It doesn't, does it? Jesus is the only one who can fix it, right? And so then you learn other people's crazy, and then you're like, no, 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 I'm out. I'm done. Like, I know you, but I can't unconditionally love and accept you, right? But then you find somebody who will. Then you get married, and then what happens? You bring this bag with you into marriage, and then everything that was normal for you and everything that was part of your childhood fits into this bag. You drag it in, and they drag theirs in because everybody's got baggage, Right? You might think you got a carry-on, but you got a steamer trunk, people. I'm just telling you, we've all got it. And so we bring that in. And then, like, you start to know one another, and you go through this stuff. And it, it, this happens in friendships. You bring this into the friendships, too, and you bring it in. And it's like, you know what? I, I'm just going to let you know me this much because the last person I really let in totally wounded me. And it affects your next friendship, right? And then, and then what happens when you have kids? Oh, heaven help us, right? Like you bring that baggage into your kids' lives and you throw that on their back and you're like, hey, there you go. Welcome. Here's the gift. And, and we bring our baggage into their lives, right? And, and so what I want us to see in this first lesson, this first lesson from the Lord in the Song of Solomon chapter one is this. You can write this down and then I'm just going to reference it through the scriptures today. But, but here's sort of the main theme that I feel like the Lord wants to give us for this first lesson in his plan to have happy and holy and healthy relationships. And it's this. You can put it up on the screen. It's to let the baggage of your past inform your present without determining your future. So you let the baggage that you've brought in with you, you let it inform what's going on presently in your life. But it doesn't have to determine the future that you have. And so let's look at God's word because I think it's a perfect illustration in the Song of Solomon 
chapter 1. And Song of Solomon is uh, one of the most interesting books in the entire Bible, right? And so it's one of the hardest to interpret. And scholars totally disagree uh, all the time about it. In fact, before the 19th century, it was totally looked looked at as an allegory book. That it, this was a symbol of a husband and a wife and the love that they had. It was supposed to be this symbol of God's love for his people. And so er, around the 1900s, they started to shift and then they started reading it. And they're like, that can't just be all it's about. Like there's marital stuff that's going on here. This is a big deal. And, and, and so this is a book about relationship. And so they started, then people decided, well, well, who's it about? Is it about Solomon and his first wife that he had is it is it something that he's looking back on as he wrote at the end of his life and he made all of these mistakes in relationship is he looking back to when he got it right and then he's writing this out this love song this mixtape love poems you know that he has and he's thinking man if I just would have stuck with this this would have been right and so today we're, we're going to look at this book together over the next seven weeks and we're going to uh, see the lessons that he has to say. We're going to see the lessons of how God knows us and wants us to reflect that to others. We're also going to see what it really means to be known in relationships of dating or friendships or parenting or in a marital relationship. And so this is for everybody. This is for everybody over the course of this next series. And so today we're going to look at what it really looks like to bring this baggage in with you into whatever relationships that you have. And so let's look at what he says. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. And so here's what it says. The song of songs, which is Solomon, the bride confesses her love. Look at what it says, verse 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than what? Better than wine. I, I love this. Like, this is new love, right? You know, this is like, I love you more. I love you more. Love you more. No, you, 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 you. You know, it's like, whatever. Okay. But here it is. Here's what she says. She says, your love is like intoxicating. This brand new love, it makes me giddy with excitement. I feel lightheaded, y'all. It's like I'm buzzing more than the glass of wine would make me buzz. Like you are incredible, right? This is what she's saying about this new guy. Isn't that so true when you start out something new? Like when you start something new, there's all this hope, all this possibility, right? And you don't see any of the roadblocks, you know, that happens in a friendship that happens when you hold that baby for the first time. You're like, oh, we got this. We've read every book there is. We're going to be dynamite parents. And then you take the kid home and you're like, they actually let me take that kid home? I don't have a clue what I'm doing, right? And it's all brand new. And there's this joy that's welling up inside of her as she meets Solomon for the first time, her betrothed. Now look what it says, verse 3, your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is like oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. She, she's talking about his name, his reputation. She's like, everywhere you go, guys want to be you and the girls want to get with you. Like, you're incredible. And your reputation precedes you. Like, everybody knows what a great guy you are. Did you feel like that? When you first started in friendship, like you, your, your reputation prestige, it's like, oh, you know, you're just, you're such a hard worker. Oh, you're so dedicated. Oh, you're such a servant. Or oh, you're so funny, you know, or whatever it is. Like you wear that reputation. And she says, everywhere I go, when I hear people call out your name, it just brings a smile to my heart because you're so amazing, right? Now, now let me ask you this. Once you've been a friend for five years, 10 years, 15 years, once you've been married for 5, 10, 15, 50 years, once you've had that kid for in their teenage years, right? Like, does the sound of their name still bring that to your, to your heart, right? And, and she's in the middle of this place. She's like, oh, your reputation. Like, every time I hear your name and they talk about it, you're such an amazing guy, right? Now, look at what it says, verse 4. Draw me after you. Let's run. The king has brought me into his chamber. She, she gets to meet face to face with him for the first time. She's like, I, I really want to get to know you better. Like I see all these things, but I want to know you more. And now you have this chorus. This is the daughters of Jerusalem. She Snapchatted it out about, you know, this brand new guy that she's with. She's like, oh, he's so good, girl. Like, and then look at what they say back. He said, we will exult and rejoice in you. We'll extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. They're like, yeah, he is a catch right? 
Now, now look at what it says. I love this. She's like, Cal- Calgon, take me away. Like, let's just go. Like, let, let's go somewhere. Let's, let's be alone. Let's get to know each other. Like, I, I, I want to know you better. I want to know you more. But, but how many of you know that the reality of a relationship lived up close is totally different than the idea of a relationship from afar, right? It's totally different, isn't it? Whether it's friendship or, or dating or marriage or, or parenting or being a grandparent. Like these things, that whole idea of what friendship includes or what parenting includes or what all these things, like the whole idea of it from afar, it sounds great. Like how many of you were the best parents in the world before you had kids, right? You know what I'm saying? Like you could have wrote parenting books like, oh, I can't believe that. What's wrong with their children? Like this is, re- when I have children, they'll never do that, right? Like and then it, <laughs> Now you're kicking yourself, right? And then in the middle of this thing, like there's something different when it's up close and personal. And it starts to get real because everybody's got it. And there comes a point in the relationship where you can't keep it because your crazy is dishing out. It's like leaking out the sides, right? And who you are, you can't just put that best face forward anymore. Like you're, you, you really got to release some of that baggage. It's time to unpack and this is what she does. I mean, she's so brave. In the middle of this deal, she, she looks at her betrothed and, and she looks at it and she's like, I, I want you to know I have a past. And, and I want to inform you because sometimes it'll influence my present. Like, you want to know why I do what I do? Well, it's right there. But it's not an excuse. I'm not saying it's who I'm always going to be. I'm not saying it's always going to determine my future. I just want you to know me. And so if you want to really know me, we got to open up this bad boy and start to look at the baggage that I'm bringing to be really known. And so she's so brave. Look at what she says. Verse 5. She says, I'm very dark, but I'm lovely. Daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Don't gaze at me because I'm dark. The sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were what? Angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard, I haven't kept. She says, like, I know that the culture of the day says this is what beauty looks like. And that's not me. She's like, I had a hard life. Like, I'm not one of those pampered beauty queens who got to just lay around the house all day and be pampered. Like, I'm scarred by the sun. Like, I, I, I've been out working. That was my life. It's totally different. I don't fit like what the magazines say is, is the perfect 10. Like, I, I, I don't do that. But listen, I, I'm strong. You have no idea how strong I am. She says, I'm, I'm like the, the tents of Kedar. These were the nomadic people. They were the, the Bedouin shepherds. They would take, they had these tents and they had to be unbelievably strong because they would take them up and put them down all over the different parts of the desert. And so they, they were harshly beaten by the sun and the winds and the rain and everything that would come, but they were always able to stand and provide shelter. And she says, look right here. She says, you have no idea what I've weathered in my life. And I may not be what culture calls beautiful, but I'm lovely. And you have no idea how strong I am. But I got this baggage. The stuff that happened in my family, it wasn't good. I I, I was totally abused. Like they looked at me and, and they were the pampered ones and I was the servant. Like my mom didn't show me the love that I should have received. My brothers, they took advantage of me. And she starts to unpack this baggage. You know, that happens for all of us too, right? Like when you're in a relationship, whether it's a friendship or a dating relationship, for, for some of us, we, we need to do a little unpacking today, right? And so I, I brought along a few things, and this is either going to be like the worst thing ever or really amazing, so you decide later. <laughs> but, you know, we all have stuff in our bag, right? And for some of us, we, we unpack things when we start to get to know people and things like conflict, how conflict was dealt with in your family, you know what I mean? Like, and for some of y'all, you know, your conflict in your family when you grew up, you're like, bring it on, baby. I can't wait. Let's get this going. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Come on. Bring it. Bring your best argument. I will fillet you. Like, I, I, I will knock you down. Like, stay down. Don't get up. Stay down. No, no, no. You're out. KO. Like, it's done. I'm ready to fight you. Like, this is good. And so you have this conflict where it's like, I love conflict because I'm a win, right? 
And so you bring it into your relationship, and this is your baggage. So every time conflict pops up, you're like, this is a fight to be won, baby, right? You know, and you're ready to go. You're ready to duke it out because it's part of your baggage. Others of you, you grew up in a family more like mine than I grew up in, and it, it wasn't like the crazy, you know, let's fight. It was like whenever conflict came, here's what they did. There's conflict. <gasps> what are we going to do? We, we better get that away. Sweep that under the rug. Pretend like everything's good, all right, until it blows over. And for some of you, that's your baggage. Like, you don't even know how to have a good fight. And, and so, like, you, as soon as conflict comes, oh, my gosh, he's mad at me. <laughs> right? In the middle of this deal, and it's like, well, I don't know what to do. How do I fight? Well, I don't know. Is this okay? Is this normal? Like, is, we disagree. Right? And you bring your baggage into the relationship. Maybe it was something about apology, right? And in my family, here's how we do it, right? You know, in your family, maybe it was like you had this blow up, but as soon as you were done, one person says, sorry, right? That, and, and they're like, oh, get over here. I forgive you. It's all good. And then you move on, right? Then for others of you, like this baggage that you carry around, it's something like this. We don't ever say we're sorry. I never got an apology. People just get over it, right? Like I'm sure they had a part in it too, so whatever, it's done. Or, or maybe it was like in your house, the apology was something like this. Like, oh, well, you know, um, how, what can I do to make it up to you? I feel so terrible. And so even though they said, sorry, like it doesn't mean sorry. Because you're like, well, you said sorry, but you didn't offer to rub my back or bring me flowers or nothing. Like, what's wrong with you? Right? Because that's not sorry. How we say sorry is we show this, right? And then it's, so you bring that in. And you can imagine what happens for two people in a friendship or two people in a marriage or dating relationship. Maybe, maybe it's not that at all. Maybe it's like this. Maybe this is what you bring into your relationships. It's like everything that you grew up with, you're just like, well, I know there's probably a dark cloud around the corner somewhere. Right? You got this sadness that accompanies you wherever you go. And it's like, well, times are good now, but I got this ready because I know something bad's getting ready to happen. Right? And you just bring this sadness with you. Or maybe, maybe for you it wasn't that. Maybe it was something like this. And you're like, I am so scared. Right? <laughs> it's like, I am not jumping in the deep end unless I have my floaties. Like, there's no way. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Right? And like fear dominates your life because it was a part of you. And so you bring that in, and it's like, well, is it safe? Well, where are the children? It's been 30 seconds since I heard where they were. Where are they? Are they okay? Right? You know, and it's like you got this fear thing going on. You never want to take any risks because it's like, unless it's safe, it's not appropriate. Right? And so you bring your fear into the relationship. Maybe bring, you know, some addiction or something like that. You got a little, anybody like cigars? Well, I'll give it to you after. But anyway, maybe you just bring your addiction in. Maybe it's like the pain of that. Maybe for you it was something like this. In your family it was, you know, like you had this critical spirit. And everywhere you went, boy, you were ready to cut somebody down, you know. It's like you look at them and you're just ready to like, all right, let's make fun of people right now. You ready? Like, let's criticize. And so everywhere you go, you're like chopping them down and you're just whittling away at people. And it's like, that's what you do, right? Like, that's how you show love. You know, you never say like, great job because you're supposed to get an A. You're smart. Like, would I expect something less from you? Like, I'm not one of these people that's going to expect something less. Or you know what? Hey, I'm not going to tell you how good you did. I'm just always going to poke holes in it and tell you where you didn't do good. Right? Well, you know, you could do this better. Well, this is a re And so you just cut people down and you walk around with this critical spirit and you're like, this is part of it. Right? And, and see, here's the thing. Some of us, like, here's what's more sad than anything. Some of us don't even know what's in here. Like, you don't even know. Like, you just walk from relationship to relationship to relationship and you just blow up everyone. And you're like, do you know what's wrong? These people. And it's like, well, you know, are you a common denominator in that relationship too? Like this string of failed relationship. Could you think of anything else that could have contributed to the downfall? Let's see, who else was a part of it? You were, right? And so, but we don't even know what's in here. And so for some of you, I hope during this series, you can sort of open it up and be like, what baggage am I bringing in? Because I need to know this. I can't really be known until I know myself, right? I can't share with anybody until I know what's going on. There are others of you, it's like, well, here's what I need to do. I, I, I need to unpack a little bit because here, here's what you do. You walk around like this and you're like, uh-uh, you can get this close. But like my bag is going to keep, oh, Lord, that almost cut my toe off. 
I'm going to use marshmallows as an illustration next week. But here's what you do. Wow, that was close. Thank you, Lord. All right. You keep people at arm's bay, right? And you're like, you're not getting in. You're not getting close. Because here's the thing. Like, do you know what happened last time I let somebody in? Last time I let somebody in, do you know how much they burned me? Do you, do you know what that affair did to my family? Do you, do you know what that lie did? Do, do you know how I entrusted? Like, I unpacked my most secretive of baggage. And I trusted you with that stuff. And what did you do? You went and you told somebody else. You destroyed me. And so now you walk around saying, well, I don't, I don't want to be known. It's better just for me to keep this to myself. And for some of you during this relationship series, you need to, you need to open up, even if, you know, there's danger there. Like, you know, but, but there's danger in holding the shield too. And so you need to open up and sort of unpack the baggage that you have so that you can see you are loved and you are accepted. Because look at me, even if you're not by the person you open up to, you totally are by Jesus. He knows everything that's in that bag. Do you know what he did? Like when he was on the cross, he took all of this criticalness and he took all of the different things, you know, and he strapped them on himself. Like he took your whole suitcase and he was like, I got it. And he put all the baggage on himself. And he said, okay, Father, you pour out on me the punishment that they deserve. I'll experience all their wounds. I'll experience all their shame. I'll experience all their guilt from all of their baggage. And he paid for it in full. Because he loved you and he accepted you. And he said, my love is unconditional. And so for some of us, we need to open up. That's what this woman did. Like she totally opens up. She lays all of her crazy out there. You have no clue about my family. This is what happened. I'm not what you would call beautiful. And she opens up about her insecurities and she tells her baggage. And then she just waits for a response. And look at what he says to her. I love this. The next verse. Here's what he says. She tells him. So tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon, for why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of her, your companions? She says, all right, so now you know me. Do you, are you still in or out? I, I would love to meet up with you later. Like, you tell me where you're going to be, where you're going to take your flocks, because I don't want to go around looking for you, right? Like, so if you're not in, uh, then whatever. I'm not going to wander around like, is it you? No, you're not the one. Is it you? No, you're not the one. Is it you? No, you're not the one. Like, you just tell me if you're in, you know all my stuff. And are you going to accept me? Yes. Are you going to love me? Yes. If so, then you tell me where you're going to be, because, like, I want to get to know you better. And so look at his response. Verse 8, he says, well, if you don't know, what, it, what does he call her? Almost beautiful among women. Follow in the tracks of the flocks and pasture your goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Like, I wouldn't say that's the best pickup line in the world, but <laughs> your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with a string of jewels. I lo he, he looks at her and he says, I see all of this. And I want you to know, I see you different than you see you. Like, you look at yourself with your insecurities, and I look at you, and I say, you're gorgeous. Like, I don't care if you're not what the magazine says is beauty. I look at you, and whatever you are, that's beauty to me. Like, husbands, can I just say something to you in here? This is your definition of beauty, whatever your spouse looks like. That's what beauty is. It doesn't matter what a magazine says. It doesn't matter what society says. Oh, this is, like, he never debates her. He's not like, well, you're not dark. No. Like, he doesn't debate her about her own insecurities about herself. You'd had a great life. What are you talking about? I mean, hard work builds character. Like, he doesn't debate her about that. Like, he just says, okay, you think this about you, but I want you to know this is how I see you. I totally see all of this, and I say you're accepted and loved. And then he says, you're the most beautiful horse I've ever seen, which is weird. Now, this guy, he knew something about horses. Solomon, you ready for this? He had a stable of 14,000 horses. He knew horses. And he knew stallions. And he knew what would happen if he released a beautiful mare in amongst the stallions. He'd be like, everybody's trying to get with you, girl, right? Like, and he says, you're so beautiful. 
Pharaoh would take and he would take the most beautiful mares and he would decorate them in all of this jewelry as they preceded the army out to war. He wanted everybody to see how beautiful his horses were. And so he's like, I can't wait to get to know you better and put some jewelry on you so you can walk around. Everybody sees how gorgeous you are the way that I see that you're beautiful. Isn't that amazing? Now look at what he says. I love this. The others say this. We'll make you ornaments for gold studded with silver. Right? And then she says, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth his fragrance. But my beloved to me is a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved to me is a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. It's getting hot in her. <laughs> Behold, you are beautiful, my love, he says. Behold, you're beautiful. Your eyes are like doves. You got both of them. That's awesome. <laughs> then she says, Behold, you're beautiful, my beloved. Truly delightful. Our couch is green and the beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. He's, so that they have the date. And not just one, not just two, like a lot. And, and they're out in this field together. And she's like, look at this beautiful lush grass. It's almost like God laid out a perfect house for us. Look at the cedars that are, it's almost like they're the beams of our house. I just love being with you, right? It, it, she's truly known and truly loved and accepted, right? Unconditionally. And he looks at her, he's like, you're so beautiful. I wish you could see you the way I see you. And she looks at him and she's like, all night last night I tied up this little sachet of herbs and spices and I, I left it laying there so that when I'd wake up in the morning I could take it off and everywhere I went there would be this fragrance of the smell, it would be my perfume. I can't wait till that's you laying right here. I can smell your smell all day. She's like this great anticipation, love that lies ahead. Listen, this is amazing. I want you to see the difference in how she describes herself in verse 1 than how she described herself earlier. Look at what it says, chapter 2. After she's unpacked and she's truly known and truly accepted and truly loved unconditionally. Look at how she sees herself after that. Look at what it says, chapter 2, verse 1. Read it with me. She says, she's not, she's not a tent anymore, right? She's not just strong. Look at what she says. I'm... I'm the rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Do you see the difference that it makes? When you act like Jesus does for you. Like, see, when you open up all this, this is who I am, Jesus. I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I'm broken. All this stuff inside of me. I don't want to be this anymore. God, like, this is who I was, and it can inform who I am right now. But, God, I don't want it to be me into the future. And so I just open this whole thing up to you, God, and say, you need to heal me. You need to rescue me. You need to save me. And Jesus says, done. Right? I know you, and I love you. You're truly known and truly loved and then when we act like jesus and we go into a relationship and we start to pull out little doses of crazy right because we don't want to unpack everything all at once but like when we start to dish out little pieces of it and it's like this is me listen i want you to know i'm a little insecure so if i act insecure and get upset about something it should inform you this is what i grew up with and so maybe you'll understand better and not like get so upset with me, but it's not who I want to be. So maybe you can help me with that. This is what I grew up with. You want to know why I get so upset so quickly? That was normal in my family. Like people just put on the gloves and they just launched out. This was normal. And it's who I am right now. I'm not proud of it, but this is normal. And, but, but it's not who I'm going to be. But I want you to know me so it can inform the present without determining the future. Can you help me with that? Like, this is who I am with negative. I'm a negative person. Like, you know, it's just like I always spot the dark cloud in every sunny day. Like, that's just part of what I grew up with. It's part of what's been put into me because I was burned time after time after time after time. So this is who I am right now, and it should inform you so that you can understand me, but that's not who I want to be. Can you help me? Do you know what happens when somebody is truly known and truly loved? They flourish. And they start to see themselves the way God sees them. That's huge. Today, some of you, um, as we start this series, 
you, you really need to know what's in your bag. Maybe you just need to spend some time praying and saying, God, what if I drug into this friendship? What if I drug into this relationship? What if I drug into this marriage? What if I drug from my previous marriage into my dating life now? What if I drug into my parenting Right? Because all that's in there. So God, would you just show me if there's some areas where I'm not living in happy, holy, and healthy relationships. I've got this baggage that I brought. Would you just show me what it is so I can truly know it myself? There are others of you that you've been standing at arm's length. It's not worth it to be known. I want to tell you, it so is. Because you're going to find someone, a friend, a family member, a co- whatever, who, who will know you and say you're truly known and truly loved. The freedom that brings is huge. There are others of you that are in a relationship and you've known each other a while. You need to start to unpack. Or maybe they already have. And you've said, right? Listen, we need to do what Jesus did. And see the baggage and say, you're truly known and truly loved. It'll help me understand you right now. But I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you so that God can bring healing to you so this isn't who we both are into the future. Let's pray. This morning, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, just know this. He is better than Solomon. He's better than Solomon. He knows things about you you don't even know about yourself. He knows all of your baggage. And do you know what? He chose before he ever even spoke the world into existence. He chose to love you. He chose to adopt you as his son or daughter. With him, he is the perfect relationship. Because he says you're truly known and truly loved. He proved his love for you on the cross. He proved his love by coming back from the dead. And right now he's saying, would you surrender to me? He's the rightful leader of your life. And so, listen, if if you feel in your heart that you desire to be known by him, you can't want that on your own. It's not about praying a prayer or walking an aisle or checking a box. It's all about the attitude of your heart and what God is doing. Would you just say these two words? Would you just say, I surrender? Just tell him, I surrender. I surrender. I, I surrender. I want to be known by you, truly known and truly accepted and truly loved and truly forgiven. And if you pray that just right now, the Bible says that you've crossed over from a destiny of death to a destiny of life, a brand new relationship that lasts forever. And so I want to celebrate that with you, that little response card, fill out your name and address, put a check in the top box that says, I prayed to receive Christ. Then leave that in your seat. I'm going to send you a book in the mail this week about what you do now. But for those of you that have been believers for a long time, I just want to ask you, do you know what's in your bag? Do you know what's in your baggage? For some of you, that's going to reawaken things that you've tried to stuff down for years. But you can't get healing until you acknowledge what's in there. That can be so scary, but would you just ask the Lord and just say, God, okay, you know this is in here. I'm tired of trying to stuff it down and act like it's not part of my past. It's affecting my present, but I don't want it to determine my future. So, God, I'm unpacking this to you first and asking for you to bring healing. And This week, God, would you help me through this series to develop a relationship where I feel safe with one person to be able to unpack some of this with them, where I can be truly known and truly loved. Others of you in the house that you already know, but you need to open up. Maybe some of the issues you're having in your dating or with parenting or or maybe it's in friendship or in your marriage is because you know what's in your bag, but you're not expressing that to the people around you. You're not going back and apologizing to your kids and saying, you know what, like that was totally wrong. I, I don't want that to be how I act in the future. You know, this is a reason why, and it's not an excuse, but this was part of what I saw, and it's normal for me now, but I don't want it to be normal forever. So please forgive me, and would you pray for mom or dad? Like, you will show them the baggage that's there, 
Maybe for you it's in your marriage, whatever it is. You need to unpack it so that you have this chance for healing. Others of you, you need to stop holding it as a shield and letting the wounds of the past dictate the relationships of the present. It's time to be known again. So, Lord, would you just do that? Would you help us? We thank you that you are the better Solomon who knows us completely and we're completely loved. Make our relationships happy and holy and healthy as we follow your plan this week. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said.